Give me a second. My name is Dennis Gill, and I'll do the intro while I bring up my slides. And if you know old guys, we cannot multitask, so <laughs> this will be good. Uh, Dennis Gill, and I came from Greenville, South Carolina, but I'm familiar with the upper Midwest. I lived in Chicago for about seven years and been to Fargo in January, so the weather did not shock me. It's not snowing. That is good. So we're here. Uh, I was hoping for a little bit of that. Uh, here we go. Here we go. There it is. Can you all see that? Yeah. I got to update my picture. That's when I had hair. Uh, it's, it's, it's going bye-bye. Uh, you know, but so what? It's overrated. All right, my title is the journey towards recovery. And I operate under the premise that we all are recovering from something. Is that a fair statement? Amen. Amen. And everybody loves a good comeback. We just do. We just, we're always rooting for those folks. We just love a good comeback. So uh, that, my marketing guy came up with that title. He said, Dennis, you need a cool title. And I'm going to move. Watch the cameraman. Hey, you guys, can, can you keep up? Hey, you've been back there sitting there the whole time. I'm going to keep moving and grooving. Um, he came up with that title. I said, you know, Journey Towards Recovery, you need to talk about that. You need a fancy title. And I said, dude, I came up. I was an accounting major in school. We're, we're, we're pretty direct to the point. You know, suicide stinks. That's what I came up with. Um, genius, right? So let's go with this. My talk. Dennis Gillen, Suicide Stinks. Thank you, North Dakota. That's all I got. Take care. I'm going back to Greenville. <laughs> man, oh man, do I wish I could say two words and get out of here. I totally wish I could say two words and be gone. But I do think I nailed it with that right there. But for years, and then Cora talked about, you know, six months, she couldn't say the word. You couldn't talk about Stephen. I'm a little longer than that. 16 years. Couldn't talk about it. 16 years in my little man cave. And people would come up to me and they knew my story and they would say, hey, Dennis, this person lost somebody. I'd be like at a cocktail party or some kind of soiree because that's a kind of a cool word, right? So I'd be at some function and they'd say, Dennis, this person lost somebody to suicide. You two should talk. And I would try to get out of the conversation. I would say something like, hey, isn't that big boy from Outcast over there? And get out of there. Now, the kids, you may know Big Boy from Outcast. Remember when you were in junior high? Shake it, shake it like a Polaroid pitcher. Come on, hey, y'all. Do I have to bring the song up? Do I have to go on Spotify? Do I, don't make me do it. Can you hear it? Now, do you know who Big Boy is? No, I can't turn it off. I went a long way for a very bad joke, but I do know Big Boy because that's me and Big Boy right there. There we go. I told you I know him. <laughs> All right, I didn't know who he was. I did not know who he was. I was at a football game in Atlanta where a friend of mine was coaching. And his wife says to me, he says, hey, you know who's sitting in front of you? She goes, Big Boy. I'm like, well, just some dad yelling at his kid. That's all I saw. You know, his kid was playing football. I was like, he's like, dad, like, well, you're just yelling. He goes, no, that's Big Boy. I was like, eh, it doesn't ring a bell. Outcast. Eh, still nothing. And then she said, shake it. Shake it like a Polaroid picture. I said, all right, that I know. That I know. And look at it, he's got, he's got a selfie pose. He's like this. I'm like, where's the button? You know, like that. I got, I'm going to get better at it. Maybe some of you all, young kids, can help me out there. All right? So there we are. I was trying to get out of it. And, you know, I like that quote. That's great. I'm hip. I'm closer to needing a new hip than being hip. So, <laughs> but when you type your own slides up, you get to put the captions in. All right. Quick note on the talk. And I already alluded to it. Not a psychiatrist, not a psychologist. I was just bopping through life when some events happened to me, and here we are. And when, you know, when I was doing with, with that person at the, at the cocktail party, trying to get out of the conversation, I was deflecting. And all you therapists know that. You ask a question, oh, boo, deflect. You know, I'm going this way, zigzag. You know, let's do that. I'm really good. I got a black belt in deflecting. And then I realized recently when I was watching a movie that I'm not – deflecting. I'm channeling my inner Wonder Woman, Wonder Woman. She's got the bracelets. She's the greatest deflector on the planet. She's got those bracelets. All right, the kids are looking at me like, I don't know that one. All right, there's yours. Come on now. <laughs> Linda Carter will always be my Wonder Woman. Always. 
And I got the old guy's attention in the back. That's good. Uh, <laughs> but I'm not a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. So, you know, let's, let's be done. Like, look, I'm, in, I'm five minutes in this presentation. What, what, I haven't even touched on the subject yet. I'm deflecting. Everyone's out there analyzing right now. All oh, you license. Like, I know, he's still doing it. He's still doing it. So Wonder Woman has this whip. It's also the lasso of truth. She will wrap it around somebody. And they have to tell, him, tell her the truth. She wrapped it around a guy. It's always a dude. It's always a guy. She wraps it around and said, who sent you? Where are you from? And he has to tell her. So I'm going to put on the lasso of truth. Deflection over. I'm going to tell you how I got here. I was one of five kids growing up outside of New York, a suburb, any town USA, five of us. On our cul-de-sac, there were three houses, 16 kids. It was awesome. It was awesome. Um, just a great place to grow up, little town outside of New York. My dad worked in the city, and we were in suburbs. There's anywhere, you know, woods behind us. Life was good. It's Sheila, Mark, Dennis, me in the middle, Janice, and Matthew. And I was a junior at West Virginia University, right in the middle of it. And, and kids, help me out here. You're still in school. Do they still do this in school? You have a week where you have a test, like in every subject. Do they still do that crap? Yeah, yeah. It's not, yeah. Remember that when you're in school? Like every project is due this week. You have weeks where you just coast. And then all of a sudden, I got a test on this, I got a test on this, all in the same week. It's like the teachers conspire against you. I, I was in one of those weeks. I told you I was an accounting major, all kinds of tests, marketing tests and Tuesday. I had an accounting and a finance test on Thursday, back to back. I could barely pass one of them. Let's put them back to back. Let's see how he does. It's not going to be good. So Wednesday, I remember this day like it was yesterday. I was packing up my backpack. I was putting my books in there. All right, Wednesday books, Thursday books, because I have to study. I was going to go downtown. I lived off campus. And I was going to go downtown and pull an all-nighter. Anyone ever do that? That takes like a year off your life. That's awful. I even packed a baseball hat because we know that counts as a shower, right? You put the hat on. I, go, <laughs> I shoved it in there. I'm like, I'm just going to pull an all-nighter. I'm not going to shave. and it's going to go boom. Take it, spit it out, and be done. So as I'm packing up the backpack, I said, man, this is going to be a long day. Little did I know how long that day would get. The phone rang, and my life changed. Remember the Gillen Five, Sheila, Mark, Dennis, Janice, Matthew. Janice is on the phone. I could barely make out what she's saying. But all I heard was, you need to come home. It's Wednesday, I'm eight hours from home. I'm exactly where I think I need to be. She goes, no, you don't understand. Mark died in a car accident. You all know why I'm here. Mark battled depression for years, and the disease state won, and we all lost. Mark died in a car, but it never left the driveway. It doesn't matter how. It doesn't. We don't talk about means. It doesn't. Mark was gone. Mark died by suicide. And then I made a huge mistake in my life right here. If I can do it audible in my life. I went home. I got that news Wednesday night. Uh, Thursday, they arranged for me to fly home. So I flew back to New York. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, I was back in school on Tuesday. That's how we did it back then. Boom, 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 you know, gone, and I split. And trust me, I wanted out of there anyway. That was ground zero. I was running from it. Left everybody behind, my dad, my mom, my sisters. I'm like, I'm gone. I went back to school. That's a mistake. That was a stressful life event. Is that fair to say? And I didn't handle too well. And then when I went back to school, I did not do what I should have done and done some self-care, what I know now. I went back to school and started <laughs> drinking. I love this guy. Look at this guy. <laughs> Look at that guy. I don't know why it is about the internet. The internet loves cats. We had a dog photo today. I like dogs. All right. Even if they're four pounds. Jeez, that's not a dog. That's an overstuffed rat. Uh, <laughs> where's Cor? <laughs> hey, hey now, hey now. Don't pick on the dog. All dogs are therapy dogs. All cats are just cats. Um, <laughs> But I don't know what it is about, I, I typed in drinking and this picture showed up. So um, this is what I did. I, I, I could have went and saw a competent counselor. We had counseling on campus. I even did some you know, prayer groups for a while and I stopped going to those. 
and this is a, we do, we do all be fair to say this is a negative coping skill. There's a trauma involved and I'm not gonna put a Band-Aid on it with this stuff. And when you do this stuff, it's, it's not good and it led to other stuff, just not a good lifestyle. Here's why it's a horrible idea. I wasn't the only one doing it. Remember the Gillen Five. Sheila, Mark, now in heaven, me, Janice, Matthew, my younger brother. I can still see him in that shirt. I can still smell him. You know how people have a smell? I can just remember him, especially boys. We have an awful smell, but it's just, they have a scent. I can remember him in that Ranger shirt. It was mine. I gave it to him. <coughs> 11 years later, 11 years later, I think I'm past Mark. Married, living in Carlisle, Pennsylvania. Got a house, got a little picket fence, all that other stuff. And in a drunken stupor with access to lethal means, this is the toughest slot I got. These next three words get me. Matt is gone. That's two. Folks, one is too many. We have 45,000, over 45,000 in America today. This is the latest stats, 45,900. One is awful. Two will wreck you. And it's just different when it's your little brother. That's the guy I think I should have been looking out for, but I was too busy in my own bubble, numbing my pain, not to see his pain. We're all were in pain. The entire family was in pain. But nobody really talked about Mark. And I'm going to take that one to my grave. Now, I drove from... Carlisle, Pennsylvania, New York, we buried Matthew. On the way back, I started thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? Now what? How do I numb this pain? Folks, I'm here to tell you I didn't do this, and this is everywhere. Everywhere I speak, and my heart goes out. I often share the stage with somebody who's gone through this. The opioid to heroin highway is well paved. It's awful. And the last time I spoke in Columbia, South Carolina, there was a guy who went before me who went to rehab 12 times, which tells me we never give up on people. And finally, he's out and he spoke before me. His story was fascinating. 12 times, heroin, 12 times. And he finally beat it. Now he runs the Central, you know, South Carolina Midlands Recovery Center. We never give up on people. That's why people go, oh, you only give them Narcan twice. Bull crap, you give them Narcan every time you get it. We don't give up on people. We never had this guy Bobby now, if that was the case. So I was watching his presentation, like, holy miracle. And I also do this presentation at a homeless shelter. And some of those folks are in there because of drugs and, and traumas and other stuff. And they're, they're wonderful people. Just, just, you know, we're all a couple bad decisions away from being right next to them. That's a fact. I'm speaking for myself there. Though I forgot this slide was in my deck and I could see it like on the preview when I was at the homeless shelter. And I'm like, oh, I should have taken that slide out. This is a tough subject. But when it came up, they all went like this. No, you didn't do that. Like they were rooting for me. And I'm happy to report to them and I'm happy to report to you. I didn't do that. On the way back from New York to Carlisle, Pennsylvania, I started thinking like, Dennis, what are you going to do? Now you're vulnerable. I was vulnerable the whole time, but now I really felt it. The two guys were gone and I'm the last Gillen boy. Self-inflicted. But remember, perception is reality. That was my perception. That was my reality. I decided to take a t time out from drinking. Now, stay attention, pay attention to this part, especially you folks online. I know you're checking email. I see you. Uh, we've all done it. Come on now. <laughs> no pointing fingers, right? Three of them are pointing back at me. Now, you're, be prepared to be amazed with my PowerPoint skills. Watch this. Ooh, check out Mr. Animation there, huh? All right, my kid did that. I have no idea what he did, but it works. But I got home and I said, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to take a time out from drinking. And I'm happy to report, happy to report, that it's still going on. Thank you. Thank you. My fragile male ego appreciates that. Um, but, you know, I'm not counting. I just know the last day I got drunk was the night before we buried Matthew. I got hammered. And it's 27 years, six months. I don't count, but I know the day we buried Matthew. So I look on this interweb site, um, and it tells you how many days, too. You can count the days. It's over 10,000 days sober. And when people clap, I say, thank you, thank you, thank you. But I want to throw it back to you all. 
if you're going through something, you're the reason I'm here today. If you're going through something, do me a favor, go through it sober. Now, I speak a lot of colleges, and the kids love that part. When I come on stage, hey, kids, don't drink. They're like, beat it, Grandpa. All I'm doing is <laughs> I'm negotiating. That's all I'm doing. I'm negotiating here. I'm working, I have two boys now. Like, come on, guys, work with me. Work with me. If you're going through something, especially depression, because alcohol is a depressant, just take a time out. After Matthew died, I was extremely depressed. You know, you know exactly where I was. My head was so far up, you know where. I couldn't think straight. And this helped. This helped a lot. Uh, so that's what I do. Just take a break if you need it. If you're going through something, go through it sober. That's the message there for you all. And then I did another smart thing. I went and saw a counselor. And all you counselors in the room, I got to get a better picture. It's not this bad. <laughs> that a guy's eyebrows alone scare me. But, you know, it was amazing. I walked in, and I'll tell on myself, anyone who's never been in therapy, especially dudes, because we got this thing called pride. When I went to therapy, I did look over my shoulder the first time to see if anyone saw me going in. Now, I don't give a rat's rear end who sees me going in. I know I need it. Heck, the last time at Lake, Lake Psychological Group in Columbia, South Carolina, half my tennis team worked there. You know, they all, they knew it. And I walked in, hey, I'm going to see my therapist. I need it. Like if you break your arm, you go see an orthopedist. If your mind's a little broken at the time, you go see a therapist. No stigma punt on that. None. None whatsoever. One of the smartest moves I ever made. And my company at the time had uh, an EAP, an employee assistance program. And they paid for eight free sessions. And I'm cheap. So I took all eight. But also I'm smart. I've had really good insurance in my life and I've had lousy insurance in my life. I have paid cash money to go see my therapist. I started thinking like all the money I'm saving by not drinking, I could put it there, but I don't know where that money is anyway. So it's, a, it's out there, but it's going to my therapist. So it's all good. Here are some, uh, we're going to go over this and there were tons of resources for North Dakota. I looked them up online. You guys are very proactive. Could be, obviously every state could do more, but suicide prevention resources, these are on a national scale. I went and saw my primary care physician recently because I had to get a physical. And if you get to be a guy my age, there's one part of the physical, and the finger is your clue, there's one part of the physical that is not really cool. Uh, but as I was getting prepped for that, getting up from the women that we've dealt for over years, come on here, you suck it up, right? I got it. I got it. As I'm sitting there in the way, to, you know, getting prepped, they take your temperature, your blood pressure, all that good stuff. And then this woman starts reading, the nurse starts reading all these questions, and she apologizes to me. She goes, I'm sorry, Mr. Gillen, but I have to ask this question. Have you been sad lately? Not knowing what I do for a living. Teachable moment, therapist, right? Teachable moment. Anyone in mental health advocacy? I said, never apologize for asking that question. This may be the only time I got out of the house all month to come see my doctor. Coached her up a little bit. I was doing work with American Foundation of Suicide Prevention, where I was on the board. I went to my car, got some resources, because I said, what happens if someone says yes? What happens if someone says yes? You know, I'm really depressed. You better be ready for the answer. So I coached her up a little bit. So don't, that, that, that's happening. It may happen when you go get, you know, do your doctor. They're asking for this stuff. There's a thing called Zero Suicide Initiative in healthcare. They're doing it. They're doing it. And the only reason I keep moving back to back, just make sure the cameraman's paying attention. That's all. <laughs> All those resources, when I, when I moved to Greenville, South Carolina, I didn't use that big SAMHSA thing. I went to Psychology Today and typed in, they have a therapy finder, therapist finder, typed in my zip code. That's how I found Beth. Suicide Prevention Lifeline, 1-800-273-TALK. That's cut off a little bit, but Veterans Press 1, you got your own line. It's routed to a couple centers, vets, talking to vets. Uh, you have 211 here, first link. Where's my first link, peep? Are you going to 988? Every state in the year, it's happening, right? That they're going to shorten that up. July 16th, 2022. You got all your money from Vibrant. You applied for the Samsung grant. You did all that good stuff. That's right. It's out there. It's, it's what I've been working on for the last couple of months. It's going to be shortened to 988, and that makes sense. That's a hard number to remember when you're in a crisis. What's the suicide prevention lifeline number when you're in a serious you know, episode? That's a tall order. 988, we can remember. So that's going to happen. Text 741741. You probably have your own North Dakota text line too, correct? Yeah, text your zip code 898. 898 211. 
898211, text your zip code. Remember, these are national, you have local resources, I and mean, they're all around here on these tables. Just work the room, work the room. Uh, and that, that became a big issue with the uh, homeless shelter. They can't use their phone at night because they have roommates. There's four of them to a room. But when I told them about the text line, they all started writing it down. Like, that I can use. You know, after 10 o'clock, no audible phone calls. They're not allowed to do it. So that they love. Um, crisischat.org, you can do it on your computer. And 911 for emergencies. You can call law enforcement. You should call law enforcement at some times. We're doing a lot of training in our state. You're probably doing it here. We do crisis intervention training with our police officers saying a mental health call is a little different than like a, a, an armed robbery. It's a little different call. And our law officers have been really good about it. Uh, showing up, it's a, it's a four day training, at least in South Carolina, NAMI puts it on the National Alliance of Mental Illness and they, they show up and they, they're into it. Um, and then I had one kid come up to me one time and say, sir, after a college talk, my roommate has a mental health issue and if I call the cops on him, he's going to get mad at me. To which I replied, I wish my brothers were mad at me. Big effing whoop. You don't hear that every day, kids. Big whoop, right? Big whoop. He's mad at you. I'd rather someone be mad at me than I have to attend a funeral. I'd rather sit with you for days on a thank you. There you go. There we go. I'd rather that happen. So don't be afraid to, 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 to pull that card out. I did look online, yeah, there's a 988, that's coming, good to see. Uh, and then I looked online, of course, gosh, your website was awesome. I couldn't, I only take a screenshot of it, but there's all kinds of stuff there. And then first link was right below this right here. I saw you doing some living works training with assist, uh, safe talk. If this is your thing, if you think you're not, you're ill-equipped to talk about suicide prevention, one, you're here today, so you're, you're, you're working on it. So that's really good. But if you think you're ill-equipped, there's a, a ton of training off the shelf, QPRs out there for an hour and a half, safe talk, three and a half hours, assist, two days. One of the best trainings I ever did. And in fact, when I did assist training, I had to sit across from a mom who lost her son. I lost two brothers and we had a role play. And we will never forget that. Her name's Vanessa and we locked eyes and I'm like, we're doing this. We're going in, we're going in. And it was brutal, and to this day we talk about it. It was probably over six years ago. And now I'm on the train train. So you got tons of resources. Your state is actually uh, proactive, and that, like everything else, we could do more. Every one of these folks are, you know, can help. And then your behavioral health department, you name it. The coalition, a group of volunteers put together. Just get in it. If you can't get out of it, get into it. But spread the word. And don't be afraid to say the S word. That's what all those trainings will teach you. You have to be very comfortable at some point saying, are you suicidal? Now, I will tell you the first time you say that, it's really awkward. Second time, not so much. Third time, not so much. Fourth time, you got it. And you know what to do. So take advantage of it. Take advantage of it, North Dakota. Come on now. Hey, right before I was supposed to talk, you were supposed to have all these statistics, so I didn't have too many statistics. We already figured out that statistics, statistics, we could throw them all out the window because one's too many. But here are just some national ones that came out. 45,000, 12th leading cause of death. Uh, coronavirus popped this out of the top 10. It was top 10 for years. Every day, approximately 125 Americans die. You could, we could do this 11 minutes all day long. Third leading cause of death for 15 to 24 year old. But it's the 44 to 54 year old folks that worry me too because their numbers on a percentage wise are higher. That's my people. Uh, I looked up uh, North Dakota. It's like every other state's males, uh, higher percentage firearms, Native Americans, high percentages, all these numbers. We can go over them. You'll go over them. I think they're working on getting that presentation that got moved around. You're going to get the stats. You'll have stats all day long. This one's interesting. For every one death, 25 attempts. So if we're at 45,000, quick math, but over a million attempts in the US alone. Over a million. And then I had another slide, I didn't bring it take us, I didn't want to take the stats, ladies, thunder, but the ripple effect, how many people are impacted is unbelievable. Six immediate family members, 25 other folks, hundreds, thousands of people are impacted by a suicide. Thousands. So there we go. That concludes the statistics portion. We should be doing a happy dance because the 3.4% decrease is really good. My state went up in South Carolina. That was a gut punch.
that hurt. North Dakota, a little uptick, that hurt. Saw that, that hurt, that hurt. And the, I talked earlier about the zero suicide initiative and I met with these folks and I was trying to play devil's advocate with them. I said, come on, we have 45,000 a year and you think we're gonna get to zero? Come on, this is an offline conversation because you gotta believe we can get to zero. You gotta, this is how she got me. She got me and I walked right into it. She goes, Dennis, what would be a good number for you? She goes, would you be happy if we got it down to two? I said, two would be a good number. She goes, all right, which two of your family members? I'm like, you son of a gun, you got me. I walked right into it. Zero is the number. Zero is the number. I walked right into it and she got me. She goes, now you see why we're doing this? That's the bold goal. And you have to have a bold goal. So now, man, I'm all in on that one. So enough about stats. Follow, let's, let's get back to me, because you know I'm kind of a big deal. Uh, <laughs> oh, until I remember what the topic is. If I was talking about Super Bowls, I'd be a big deal. And then you go, hey, you're a big deal. I suicide. Oh, uh, you're not that big a deal. Uh, but the, I moved from Carlisle to North Aurora, Illinois. So I got a little taste of the upper Midwest weather. It didn't shock me this morning. Uh, when I moved there, I didn't tell anyone about my brothers. I was part of the stigma I'm now fighting. People would say, Dennis, how many kids in your family? I say three, two sisters back in New York and me here in Illinois. Never spoke about Mark and Matt, couldn't do it. Cora said six months, it's, you know, I'm, I'm still in it, I couldn't do it. So I went to church one day and here's how church worked for us. Now, this is classic, it's such a guy move. We would drop the kids off downstairs and the guys would come up to a room like this, all the parents and stuff, and the guys that had this back corner, and we had donuts. And we'd sit around and eat donuts. We called it fellowship. You know, we talk about our fantasy football, you know, everything but fellowship, right? We'd sit around. That's how guys work. We'd sit around talking about stuff. And then the kids would come up, and we'd go back to the service. So that's how it worked. One day, I come bounding up the steps, because that's how I roll. I come bounding up the steps, and I walk into the room, and I'm starving Marvin, and there's no donuts. I'm like, I skipped breakfast for this, you know, <laughs> where are they? And they said, hey, Dennis, they took the donuts upstairs. There's a community program. I'm like, oh, I love you guys. Smell you later. I'll sit through anything for powdered sugar. I'll sit through it. So uh, it could be like the history of the Oregon. I'm in, oh, it's fascinating. You know, like, so I get up there. I get <laughs> conveniently located near the donut table. I'm doing this, I'm starving. And they start talking about their community program. Does anybody want to guess what the topic was that day? The woman from the Suicide Prevention Services was there from Batavia, Illinois, talking about suicide. I'm like, son of a gun. I cannot get up because the door is like right there. She started. I'm over there by the donut table. I'd have to walk right in front of her. And everybody would know something's up with Dennis because I'd be crying on the way out. I know it. I couldn't deal with it. So she worked at, she ran the local hotline there. And I volunteered. On the way out of that presentation, didn't say boo to anybody, but on the way out, I grabbed her card. And I said, one day when I'm ready, I'll do something about this. And that card stared a hole at me for like months, months on my desk, totally passive aggressive move, right? I'm gonna do something. No, I'm not. <laughs> I sat there, just stared, I go, ah, I gotta call her one day. Stephanie Weber is her name, uh, awesome woman. I called her up, I said, Stephanie, I lost two brothers to suicide. And she goes, get your butt in here. That's literally what she said. What time, what do you wear, get in here. So I went through the training, I got on the Suicide Prevention Lifeline, in pretty intense training. Uh, they were certified by the American Association of Suicidology who does the audits. I think I was in there for 12 weeks. Um, a nightly program, 12 weeks. I got all the head on over here by the people who run the lifeline. It's pretty intense. And the last day was a full day and was called Suicide Saturday. And we went over suicide the whole day. And I know this because my binder is littered with tear marks. I couldn't get through that. Every page was Matt and Mark, every page dripping, dripping, dripping. But I got through it and Thursday nights from eight to 12 was my shift. My kids were little, I put them in, you know, the 7.30, bath time, all that stuff. I would sneak out the house. Nobody knew what I was doing. I'm probably pretty sure all my neighbors thought I was having an affair. But I let them talk, let them talk. 
That's on them. I was going to this, you know, you know where I was going to talk to people that needed a little hope. And I had permission to tell you about one of those calls. This kid, Kyle. Kyle's awesome. We all want to be like Kyle. But Kyle had some clues. And what happens with people, this cartoon here depicts it. What happens to, I'm going to speak for me, me. That's me upper left uh, after Matthew died. I'm not feeling it. I barely got out of bed. If I got out of bed at, by noon, it was a good day after Matt died. I was hurting for certain. But if you saw me bopping around town, how are you doing, Dennis? I'm doing fine. How are you? How are you? Doing fine. Living the dream. That's my line. I'm living the dream. All right, little funny side note about that line. I get in the, <laughs> I'm on an airplane one night. I spoke and I was real tired after speaking. And normally I stick around and I stay a day or two or debrief. But this time I had to get out of town. So I got on a plane late at night and I have a seat next to me. And I'm like, all right, I'm winning. This, this, I'm, I'm exhausted. And all of a sudden, this guy comes down the aisle, and he's like chatting to everybody. I'm like, hey, hey, hey. I'm like, oh, no. Oh, no. No, no, no. We've all seen that. Only thing worse could be a crying baby. But this guy's like, hey, how you doing? Hey, hey. He comes bopping down the aisle. I'm like, oh, he's coming. He's coming in. He's coming in hard. <laughs> Sits down next to me, talking to everybody over there. He turns to me. He goes, hey, how you doing? And I'm like, oh. I said, I'm, I gave him my line. I said, I'm living the dream. He goes, I wish I was living the dream like you. And I don't know where this came from. But it came from me. I looked him square in the eye and I said, nightmares are dreams too. And then he didn't talk to me the whole flight. <laughs> Shut that down right there. <laughs> but they are, if you think about it, you know, dreams gone awry, but mostly that's us. Facade, how you doing living the dream when we're really there? Kyle, let's get back to the star of the slide. Kyle calls up the helpline. And you can do this. I'm looking at you kids. You can do this. You can call for a friend. He wasn't the person in trouble. The person in trouble was out there in Chicagoland somewhere. And he was sending his friend, Kyle, some weird texts. One of the texts, let me know if you hear it, said this. Kyle, you've been a good friend. Did anybody hear the past tense? You, Kyle's like, I am a good friend. What do you mean? You have been a good friend. The contraction. Huh. Kyle's a smart guy. His radar goes up. He calls in and goes, what do I do? I said, where is he? We don't know where he is. Now, we're working on phones with geolocation. All that next-gen stuff is going to be really cool, but we don't know where this kid is back then. And as we're on the phone, and I'm telling him everything we can do, you know, Kyle, this is not on you. you got to triangulate. This is not just you. you got to activate the network. Right? Helpline, you got to get the adults involved. It's just two kids going, you know, in Chicagoland. Do what you got to do. Find them. If you have to call the police, call the police. We're like, this is urgent. And as we're on the phone, he goes, he goes sir, I got another text. He said, Kyle, I'll see you from the other side. Whoop. The meter just went up. I never had a call like this per se, like this hot, like this is hot. We trained for it, but this is like when I first, oh, this one's hot. This, we're, some of them are maintenance calls, some of them are warm calls. You know, this one's like, whew, here we go. Seatbelt on. So I tell Kyle everything I know to do and I hang up. That's, it's like telemedicine. We're, we're bound by the phone line. And about five minutes later, Kyle calls back and says, sir, he's not picking up. Now, we have a rule at the helpline. I'm not sure if you have it. No outgoing phone calls. That was a big rule back then. And we had one. And then I'm sitting here looking at that sign. And you're also looking at a guy that lost two brothers to suicide. I'm like, you know what? Some rules are meant to be bent. And I said, Kyle, give me the phone number. And Kyle gave me the phone number. And I dialed it. And the kid did not recognize the phone number. He picked, he's still with us. Victory right there. The fact that he said, who is this? And then he got all like indignant. Oh, who gave you my number? Blah, 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 blah. Like, oh, blow it at your rear end. Somebody loves you. Let's go. What's going on? I didn't say it like that. But that's what I was thinking. <laughs> if somebody loves you, what's happening? Where are you? What's going on? An hour and a half later. We hung up the phone, and then we came to this resolution. He was the only child failing in school, had these false comparisons to other people. You know, we, you do that with the social media now. These guys were all living the life, and I'm struggling. We all are struggling, let's be honest. And then we had a plan. His plan was he's going to tell his parents everything. 
And as a parent, bring it. Bring it. We'll go to plan A, B, C, D, E. We'll go all around the alphabet. But suicide's a forever decision. And then the alphabet gets thrown out the window. We have no other plans. So I'm so proud of that kid, Kyle. I'm so proud of him. He is a star. I hope those two boys now are out there doing something amazing. One, Kyle, and the other kid that's hopefully still with us. So that was the success story. Uh, and it's all because Kyle had clues. What are some of the clues? This is, you're probably going to go over this in your talk saves lives. Are we doing that today? I'll skim over them with this three buckets, really. Talk, behavior, mood. And I'll tell little stories about this. Um, but don't joke about it. People may joke about it. Oh, you're better off dead. They don't do that around me. And if they do it around me and they don't know my story, I don't admonish them publicly. I'll pull them aside and say, hey, you may not know this about me. But you just said something that I'm, I'm worried about you about. Are you, you said you're better off. Can we talk about that? And from a loving place, not accusatory, what's going on in your life? So they may say I have no reason. And take it all seriously and listen without offering fixes. And dudes, this is the hardest thing to do. Because this kid, think about the kid that I got a hold of. He was failing in school. He was failing in school. And if I said to him on the phone, sounds like you need to study harder. Click, you know, that's the shortest call ever, right? Come on, we don't need solutions right now. We just need a loving ear. That's all. And that's a hard thing to do. According to my wife, that's a hard thing to do because I, I do it all the time. Oh, I'm having trouble with my boss. We can kick his butt. No, that's not a good, you know, yeah, we go right to fix, you know. What's his address? You know, just listen. Just hug and listen. I'm learning, I'm learning, I'm learning. It may take me a while, but I'm learning. Talk, behavior. Substance abuse, increased use of alcohol and drugs. Hey, sleep, hopefully we'll touch on sleep. This is a big issue for me. If something is going on in my life, and Corb, you said it with your son, Steve, sleep, sleep, sleep eludes me when something's going on in my life. I'm up at two o'clock, you know, and I'm, I'm, I'm up when I should be awake, and I'm awake when I should be up, something like that. Fast backwards, switch it, reverse it, you know what I meant. Everything's screwed up. So I went to our neuroscientist speak uh, at the American Foundation of Suicide Prevention. They had a uh, convention and they, they brought this big guy in. Um, and he's, when he started speaking about sleep, I'm like, oh, I sat up in my chair because this is my issue now. And he gave us three tips and I'm going to give them to you for free. That's why you come here today. First one, and this is a non-judgmental room, right? No one judges in this room, right? We're cool. Everything's cool. I've exposed my heart to you. Do not laugh. But the room has to be dark and that I do sleep with an eye darkener. I love it. Joke all you want. That's awesome. I packed it. I have it in the hotel room right now. Phenomenal. A lot of these hotels, they light them up like Christmas trees. Doesn't matter where I am. Pop that bad boy on. It's dark. That's what he said. The room has to be dark. The other thing, it's got to be cold. 72, too warm. He recommended somewhere between like 64 to 68 degrees. If you're cheap like me, that's easy. The thermostat, I could program that thing. The wife doesn't like it. Like 63, here we go. You know, we're saving money. Um, meanwhile, you can hang meat in our bedroom. You know, you know. But it works. It does. It, 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 I notice. I notice when it gets a little warm. I don't sleep that well. I got to be in that zone. In North Dakota, just open your windows. Jeez, you know, like come on now. But what happens when you open your windows? You hear your neighbor's dog barking, right? Fido, go home. You're drunk. Come on. So that's why you recommend a white noise machine. And I have the app on my phone. That little thing. That's why if you ever run into me on an airplane, the minute they start the engines up, I'm out. It's like Pavlov's dog now. I've been conditioned to hear that noise. I've been scared by takeoff. I've been sleeping. Oh, where are we? Are we landed? No, we just took off, dude. Calm down. <laughs> it's, it's amazing how this thing works. The white noise machine. The white noise machine. So those three tips there were free. Other stuff, isolation. Hey, remember this when they withdraw, and we'll talk about this later, but remember this saying, a stick alone can be broken by a child, but a stick in a bundle cannot be broken. So bundle up. What does that mean? That means, you know, go to men's night at the tennis center like I started. I started a men's night because we just need guys to get together. Also started a men's breakfast club. First and third Thursday, we all get together because we need to get together. Find something. When I went through a divorce, 
and uh, found myself living in a town, Greenville, South Carolina, by myself. Went from a big house to a small apartment. I joined a hiking club, and I don't even like hiking. But I joined a club because I knew how to get my butt out of that apartment. This wasn't going to be good. And I drove to like a, it's weird, I drove to a McDonald's parking lot. And you get you sign a car, and it's a dentist, you'll be with this guy, Dale. And again, it sounds like a murder mystery right there. Yeah, we never saw a dentist again, right? So I get in this car, we go to west of North Carolina, which is beautiful, like yeah, Asheville area, we go hiking, it's gorgeous. It's gorgeous. But this guy, Dale, he's like 74, 75 years old. He was like smoking this trail. Like I'm out, whew, there he goes. So we get back in the car, at the, I'm, I'm spent. There's a kid behind me, 21 year old intern for BMW. He's passed out already. And I was like, Dale, what kind of pace was that? Like, I'm new to the club. He goes, 70. I said, you're like 78. What, what, how old? He goes, 76 years old. And it's like, holy crap. And he goes, then he goes, just a pile on. He goes, well, ever since I had the cancer. I'm like, what? <laughs> <laughs> you beat cancer and you're 76 and you're smoking. Like, uh, I felt terrible. But I slept good that night. And that was the goal. Hey, the, the, visiting or calling people to say goodbye. My brother Mark, on the day he died, went to visit a friend and pulled in the driveway. And I only learned this story, seriously, a couple years ago through Facebook Messenger. She wrote me and said, Dennis, I never told anyone the story. But the day Mark died, he came to visit me, pulled in the driveway. They were friends. She opened up the door, like unlocked the door, let him in, and she noticed the car backed up and left. So close. So close. Maybe he would have said something to her that would have alerted all of us. That was the day. October 26, 1983. That was the day that changed the Gillen family. So when I speak, and I'll use Mark as an example, there's only two people I ever speak to. One, you're going to look at all these, and you're going to hear them again. You're going to look at all this stuff, and you're going to be around somebody who's in crisis. Head on a swivel, head on a swivel, right? Who is the second person I'm talking to? It may be you. Raise your hand. Knowing what we know now about suicide in the Gillen family, I'm pretty sure our parents would have sold our house, all our possessions to get Mark help. Pretty damn sure of it. Raise your hand, be aware. He was so close, he gets out of that car and he says something. Everything changes for the Gillen family that day. And we still have Matthew. All right, cleaning out, giving stuff away. My mom, who's still alive, by the way, 86 years old, spunky as heck. She would be mad at me, by the way, if I wore jeans. I forgot to pack my good pants. I had khakis and I forgot them on the bed. So my apologies right now. I'm just so happy to be doing a live presentation. I'm just so happy to have pants on. Uh, <laughs> I'm all zoomed out, you know, my bunny slippers. Like, you know, I'm just excited about that. But if she sees this video, she's going to have, you know, say something. Really, Dennis Jeans? Really? Um, <laughs> that's the voice I hear in my head. She gets, she's, when she was about 80, a couple years ago, she calls me up and says, Dennis, there's a woman down the street who wants me to hold her mother's wedding ring. That's an odd request, people. That's an odd request. My mom had the notion to call me, not the girl. She knows what I do for a living. She goes, Dennis, what do you think? And I said, Mom, what do you think? She knew. She knew. She goes, this isn't good. I said, no. So I said, Mom, you need to get a couple friends, go down there and ask her what's going on. She went down there and asked her what's going on. I said, Mom, you're going to have to say the S word. And this is a tough coaching thing. Remember, I lost two brothers. She lost two sons. And I'm coaching this woman to say, you need to say, are you suicidal? Somebody in that group said it. And the woman was suicidal. She's still with us. and She still has the ring because a bunch of 80 year old women went down there and said, are you suicidal? If I could teach my mom to do it, I could teach anybody to do it. And that's why we have assist, safe talk and all this other stuff. So that's an actual real life example. And then of course, Mood, mood, suddenly happier, calmer. That one popped off at me. I remember when I was training to be on the lifeline, I said, that one was weird. Suddenly happier, calmer, but they're trying to throw you off their trail. 
they're actors. My friend of mine, when I went to a survivor suicide loss meeting, a good friend of mine, Josh Gardner, his brother, everything was great. All of a sudden, everything's great. Work, great. Relationship, great. Fact of the matter, work sucked. Relationship, bad, you know. But he was pretending because he didn't want Big Brother to know. Everything was fun, but he had a plan. And that's what made him suddenly happier calmer. The plan was he's no longer with us. That's a horrible plan from a survivor standpoint. So just be aware of all that stuff. So we'll go over that more later. Here we go. Here's a plug for AFSP. I did a, this is what I started talking about, of course. 16 years after my brother's died, I signed up to do one of these out of the darkness walks. I do one of these bad boys and I can't talk about my brothers and it, passive aggressive Dennis again, I sign up to do the walk and I do nothing. Seriously, our walk was in October. I'm on the committee, I'm on the walk committee, which basically meant I go to the meetings, I eat a donut, there's a theme here, and <laughs> I get a water and I would leave. And finally, the executive director pins me against the wall. She's a beautiful woman with piercing blue eyes. She lost her son, Clay. She goes, Dennis, can you do something? You've been coming to these meetings forever. Can you do something? That night I went home and I journaled about my brother. And journaling is a very positive coping skill. I wrote about my brothers. And I said, hey, you may know me, but you don't know this story. And it was a beautiful essay. If I don't, you know, my own uh, critic there, but I, I thought it came out really well. And at the bottom it says, do you want to send this to your contacts? And I'm figuring, I just moved to Columbia, South Carolina. I don't know that many people. Sure. And I hit OK. I used Gmail as my email at the time. And Gmail counts anybody you ever sent an email to as a contact. Some of you know where this is going. So I'm sitting there, and I'm going, wow, this is taking forever. I need a new computer. And then a little sign comes up. This is donor drive pops up and goes, congratulations, you sent out 1,783 emails. What the? <laughs> That's for those people at home. I hope don't read lips. What the heck just happened? And I'm freaking out. It's gone. It's out. Genie's out of the bottle. This story, I poured my heart out in this essay. And as I'm freaking out, I got to call my parents. My dad's still alive. Mom and dad are still there. I got to call them up and say, hey, uh, all your friend's dad who sent me those stupid golf jokes, they got it. That email went out. Called my two sisters up. Janice was like, ah, that's fine. Sheila, pissed. What? It's out. It's out. And as I'm freaking out, my phone started to ping, 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 ping. Because if you get, every time I got a donation, I would get a uh, text message. That's how it was set up. Folks, I didn't ask anybody for a dime that day. I, the letter did it all. $10,000. It was like $9,800 something dollars later. People want to help. They just don't know how. And I never asked them. No one knew. Where I, I had people I went on vacation with from Illinois said, I never knew you had two brothers. I ran into a woman in the supermarket. She goes, Dennis, I got that email. And I said, you weren't supposed to. Uh, <laughs> thank you, Al Gore. You invented the internet. Um, but that's what happened. And then what really happened was the minute I was vulnerable, here we are in the produce section. She goes, my first husband I lost to suicide. And this woman's a pillar in our, our, our community. I'm like, wow, I never knew that. She goes, I never knew your story. It's amazing what happens when we let down that facade of living the dream. It's amazing what happens. So I get to do this walk. I did a couple of them. Upper left, that's our governor at the time. She came, it was our 10th anniversary. And I don't care what your politics are. I really don't care. I lobby for mental health. And this seems to be a great unifier, by the way. It doesn't matter DR or I. It, Mental health is an issue. Both sides can agree on, truly. So Nikki Haley was awesome. She came out and did a, uh, that's my governor at the time. She came out and did a talk. Her husband's in the military. He was there. The kids were there. The whole family, the whole governor's family showed up, did a great job. She cut the ribbon and all that stuff. But she was my second favorite person to see that day. This guy, Joe, was my first. I'm working the bead table, and when you work the bead table, you hand out beads that correspond with, you have a color. I'm wearing two orange beads, which means I lost two siblings. The worst ones we give out are the white ones because it's a parent who lost a kid. It sucks. You come around the table, you hug them. It's, it, that's why we're there. We're there to heal. This guy comes up to me and goes, are you Dennis Gillen? I said, yes, I am. He goes, I heard you on the radio. Now, passive-aggressive Dennis Gillen now was all in Dennis Gillen, and I did a radio interview 
for this walk coming up. It was on public radio, like your uh, NPR station here in North Dakota. And I, I did the interview on a Thursday afternoon. And I'm starting to think, wow, I'm kind of a big deal. So I asked the producer, I said, when is this interview going to air? He goes, oh, this particular segment, we do it Sunday morning at 6.30 a.m. I'm like, what? <laughs> no one's going to hear I'm like, really? I was going to tell everybody, now I'm telling nobody. This guy comes up to me at the walk and goes, I heard your radio interview. I'm like, you're one of three people, me, you, and the producer. <laughs> and then he lays this trip on me. He goes, hey, we're both from New York. We both live in South Carolina. And we both lost two brothers to suicide. Didn't see that coming. Didn't see that coming. He drove two hours to tell me that. Every time you think you're alone, every time you think you're on the island of misfit toys all by yourself, you're not alone. That's the beauty of vulnerability. The minute I, I told people about my brothers, wonderful people like yourself started flowing into my life. But for years, there was this wall. They weren't coming in, and I wasn't coming out. Did anybody get that reference, though? I just threw one out there real quick. The Island of Misfit Toys. Did anybody? The young kids in the front, awesome. I said that out of college one time. I was like, Phew. I was like, just because it's not on Snapchat doesn't mean it doesn't exist. Come on now. It's not a TikTok, but do you know the Island of Misfit Toys? Are you ready? Does the audience know the Island of Misfit Toys? Clint in the back does, the sound guy. All right, let's see how well you know them. Audience participation, you're gonna split the room right down the middle. You're my left side, you're my right side. Just yell it out, we're gonna go around the horn and then we'll finish up in the middle. Why is the elephant on the island of Misfit Toys? Well, louder over here, but you guys said it too, but come on now, just shout it out. Audience participation, the water pistol. Ho ho, chaplain, that's it. The choo-choo. Oh my gosh, you're getting your butt kicked by a man of God. How's that feel? <laughs> I'm a boat that doesn't float. Oh, they're on fire. He should be a jack in a box. What's his name? Charlie. The gray hair is coming out. Woo, this is us, the kids of the 60s. Come on now. I'm a bird, doesn't fly. The bird. Swims, oh, left side, you're getting spanked. <laughs> but you're all winners, hope. Um, cowboy. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> a, dolly for, a dolly for Sue. A dolly for Sue. Hmm? A do, it was a dolly for Sue. Um, this is a typical reaction. And I was hoping nobody get it, including you, Chaplain. Because um, I often wondered when I was a kid, like, why is she on there? She's a doll. She looks like a normal doll. Rejected by Sue. And I heard an interview. I'm going to get teary-eyed over this. Rankin Bass. Remember Rankin Bass? That's the guy who did it. Arthur Rankin was on an interview on NPR. He said, we put a dolly for Sue on there for psychological reasons. You can't see her illness. She cried a lot. Who cries a lot? People that are depressed. She was rejected. Anyone here ever been rejected? Okay, just me. Dolly for Sue. Funny story. I was at a church doing a Rotary Club meeting, and the sound guy comes up to me, like your sound guy, Clint. They come up to me, he takes the lapel microphone off. We got a wire through my shirt. And he comes up to me, he goes, hey, that Dolly for Sue story, I Googled it. You were right. <laughs> It's like, bro, you think I lie about this stuff? Just a, we're in a church. I get hit by lightning like that. Come on. It is. A dolly for Sue. So there you go. Now you know. Now you know the rest of the story. Good night. All right. I could have started here. I can end right here. It makes sense now, doesn't it? It all makes sense. It's a Swedish proverb. Shared joy is a double joy. Shared sorrow is half a sorrow. Share your sorrows. Now I'm going to focus on the kids up front, but we're just as guilty. Social media is everybody sharing their joy. Hey, check out my cheeseburger. Hey, yeah, blow it out your rear end. We all have good days. We all have bad days. You just don't put your bad days on there. 
Nobody does. That's everybody's highlight reel. Check this out, FOMO, I'm at this party, you're not, oh, please, 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 please. We get in this comparative trap. What we ought to do is start sharing our sorrows. And think about this. Every time I share my sorrow, I cut it in half. Half, 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 half. Will I ever get to zero? No. There's always going to be something remaining, which means there's something of my brother's remaining in me. If I get to zero, I'm done. I don't feel anymore. And, and that's okay. That's the new normal. Whatever normal is, that's it for the Gillen family. And people say, oh, I'll get over it. And never get over it. You get through it. And what you look like on the other side, who knows? Hopefully it's a, a kinder, compassionate person because of the crap you've been through. So that's it. Sh start sharing your sorrow. That's the gist there. Check this out. This is me in Blythewood, South Carolina. If you look at me now, this is my goal is always to surround myself with protective factors. Uh, protective factors. I like sunflowers. I don't know why. Ever since I was a kid, I like sunflowers. Don't tell the guys at the gun club. I just like sunflowers, right? So I planted a whole row of them up and down my driveway, and they grow like crazy in South Carolina, but right near the sprinkler system. So no matter what, I, no matter what kind of crap day I had, if I pulled in the driveway, I see the sunflowers and go, eh, life's all right. Leave it in the car, Dennis. Leave it in the car. Your loved ones are inside. Leave it in the car. And I just pull up. But what I didn't realize, when I planted these sunflowers, I was actually planting a smorgasbord for a rabbit. This rabbit came by and mowed them all down. <laughs> Except the one by the road. And think about it. What am I, like 6'4", six, 6'5"? Six, okay, 5'10", never made it. <laughs> and shrinking, by the way, on the other side of that hill. But the plant is 6'4". I want them really big. These are called, um, what are they called, monster? They're the big ones. My monster sunflower, some ginormous name. They're the big. And this rabbit came out and I mowed them all down. And now I have to go back there and pick out all the stalks because this rabbit. I tried trapping this rabbit. A live trap for all you PETA fans. Calm down. Calm down, everybody. Calm down. I caught a bunch of squirrels, like two possums, and I relocated them. There was a country club down the road. They love it. They love it there. There's a pond. They, they send me postcards. They're much better. They're much better. I never caught the rabbit. He's still there terrorizing that house. I've since moved. I couldn't, I couldn't take it. I was like, rabbit, you win for sale. Oh, uh, no. Two, two survived. The one by the road is where I'm standing because there's two chicken to get near the road. And then this one by the garage, as I went to pull it out of the ground, I noticed out the side, a little bud. It's resilience. This one's like, you know what? The rabbit may have chopped my head off, but not today, rabbit. And a little bud came out the side. I'm like, well, if you don't give up, I don't give up. Into the house, the miracle grow, into the bucket. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Remember I told you I like them really high? This one did not grow that high. About here. But it was my favorite. You know why? Because it was different and it didn't give me one flower. It gave me three flowers. That's the one. That's us after a trauma. Continue to grow. This is where all the girls go, ah, and all the guys go, that's not that cool. It is cool. <laughs> it is cool. It's perseverance. It's resilience. Everything you learn, it's it. That flower is resilient. That one had it easy. It just grew straight up. No, no problem. Nothing wrong with that. No rabbit. That one fa faced the rabbit. And still said, you know what? I'm still going to grow. So that's it, folks. That's where I'm now. I have a table over here. I, got, I think I put my stuff on the snack table there. The Half a Sorrow Foundation is, is born out of, this is what I do now for full time. Um, it was born out of, I got a call from a kid in Texas one time. He said, sir, we've had a couple of suicides at our school. Can you come down? And we couldn't make it work financially, all this other stuff. So I actually had to hang up the phone. And this first time I ever said no to anyone, anywhere, ever. And I felt, I felt like crying. I was like, damn, I never said no. And then I, a lot of my friends said, hey, I can help you. I help you. How do you help me? Hey, donate. So then this kid calls from Texas and they can't make it work. I say, what time? What do I wear? We're going. We're doing this. So I started this Half a Sorrow Foundation. And uh, if you want to follow me, I'm not that big on social media. But there I am. That's a totally a fake pose, by the way. Like, hey. My photographer said, hey, pretend you're, pretend you're presenting. This is the inside the look. Hey. Uh, <laughs> Damn it, I'm wearing the same shirt too. All right. Get... <laughs> I'm a minimalist, please. Uh, I got like 19 of these, same one. Um, 
they're my brothers until we meet again. Now, I laid a heavy trip on you. That's Mark, Matt, and then Matt at, at one of my favorite places, Wilmington, North Carolina, at the beach. Um, I laid a heavy trip on you all, and you all were great. But you're also well equipped for this. You're in the business. And you're at a suicide prevention coalition, and you're going to take this knowledge you get today and go out and spread it through North Dakota. But I do want to do a little energizer. And I've, I, I speak a lot of colleges, and I've never lost doing this. I always win because I'm a winner. Uh, I'm going to split the room in half. This half of the room, the left side that knew none of the Island of Misfit Toys, this side, <laughs> you got spanked by a chaplain. This side, when I go like this, I want you to clap your hands. Just one time, clap. When I come back to this side, all I want you to do is just like an energy, go woohoo. <laughs> we'll come back to you. <laughs> There'll be some training. So, real slow. Here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go really fast. In fact, stand up for this. Stand up. Let's stretch it out. Stretch it out. I'm going to go as fast as I can. Now, all your heads are in the camera. That's classic. Oh, I didn't think they're going to stand up, did you, Cody? Ah That's why you come to the live event. Uh, <laughs> stop checking email. Um, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to go like this. And I'm going to go as fast as I can. And I'm pretty sure you cannot keep up. Because I'm wiry, and I'll be all over you like a spider monkey chip. All right? <laughs> My name is Dennis Gillen. You now know why I think suicide stinks. And thank you for that standing ovation. That was real. <laughs> So much of what Dennis said is so true, and um, I think that if there's anybody in the room or online, um, you you walk that walk, and and it really resonates. We are going to take a 15 minute break. We have one question online for Dennis. Oh. Okay. Dennis, um, someone had posted, "How do you promote hope in someone that does not have any?" There's a, there's a persistence factor there, um, never give up. Uh, and one of my friends one time, a therapist said to this person, I thought it was brilliant. She said, you know what, if you don't have any hope, I'm gonna give you some of mine. And you hold it. And when your hope comes back, you can give it back to me. And she said, two or three years later, this woman came back to her office and said, I'm here to bring your hope back. Mine came back. So that's, that was just, I heard that, I was like floored. She goes, if that happened, she came back two to three years later. So someone who's waiting in hope, it does come back. Time is an amazing way of healing. And this all sounds trite. But on the flip side of that, my brothers don't have any hope because they're not here. And they never got to sell the, you know, see the light and see how that, that process works. So just stay persistent on them. Never give up on them like we didn't give up on that sunflower. <laughs> 